the gods of the Sumerians, the god of the Babylonians, Baal, Asherah, Moloch, the gods of Greece and Rome, and Zeus, Apollo, Mars, Athena, are always, without exception, mean and proud. One of the areas of my study when I was t doing classical Greek was Greek mythology. It's one thing that you discover when you read about these gods is that they are crazy. They're not worth worshiping for sure. Why is that? Because they are made in the image of those who make them. Proud people who invent a god are going to invent a proud god. Selfish people who invent a god are going to make a selfish god. I don't know all of them, but I know a few. They're pretty mean. Pretty mean. Why do I say that? Our God comes, the God who created all the galaxies, who is perfectly holy, comes and lives as a human being, is mistreated, insulted, put on a cross, dies like a, like a human being, there's no ego with him. There's no pride. The reason that we worship God is not because God's ego is satisfied. Oh, wonderful, people are worshiping me. How great that feels. No! We worship God because it's good for us. It fills us with joy to know him, to know his goodness and his perfection. Because when we look at who we are and how small we are and how evil we can be sometimes, human beings, but we look at him, we have a glorious picture. We have a goal. We, we see what we can become. It is so wonderful for us to worship God. And it works on our ego and selfishness. It helps us be a little bit better people when we do that. Because when we look at him, we don't see all of that that we have. We don't see what's in our hearts sometimes as human beings. We see perfection. The Psalm 103 that we just read is a contrast between God, the wonderful God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Jesus, and human beings. And the contrast is so incredible. What does it say about this God? A lot of things. Not so much about human beings, but about this God. It says a lot of things. It says that his name is holy. Well, that's good to know. It's good to know that he's holy. It's good to know that God has no ego, no pride. That's good to know. I like to trust a God like that. I feel good about worshiping and listening to a God like that. But also, he forgives all our iniquities. We are sick and then we get healed. Who has healed us? The one that says that he heals all our diseases. I like a God like that, that can heal our diseases. I rejoice with that. He redeems us from the pit. And I fall into a pit. I fall into a difficult situation. And I know he has the power. I know he can take me out of there. You get a good feeling. He works righteousness and justice for the oppressed. I don't count on men to work righteousness for the oppressed. They might talk about it a lot. They might try and do their best. But God is the one who works perfectly for the oppressed, who has the oppressed at his heart. And I want to be like that. I want to feel like that too for the oppressed. Oh, I don't always maybe, but that's, what, that's my goal. See, God is not an oppressor. He's not a tyrant, a dictator, like all the other gods. There's not a worse dictator than Zeus in ancient mythology. What a wonderful thing it must have been for these Greeks to hear about God, the God of the Bible, and to convert to him, to come to him, and realize how wonderful he is. Whew, finally, I don't have to worship that Zeus anymore. Finally, I don't have to have nightmares anymore about him. Finally, I, I can relax. 
because he forgives your iniquities. He's holy. He's good. He's perfect. He's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast, steadfast love. All the other gods are very angry people. I call them people. I don't want to call them gods. Oh, they get angry so easily. Oh, it's fascinating to study, to, to study Apollo, one of the best gods, supposed to be a great god. The gods of love in Greece? Who? What kind of love is that? Ooh, I'm not get close to those guys. Who those women? Ooh, they're scary. As a father, he shows compassion to his children. He is a father, and we are his children. This is a concept that you will find only in the Bible. This is a unique concept in all religions in the world, that God is our father, and we are children. Anyone who has had children, they know what you feel for your children. You know how you feel for them. You know how you would give your life for them when you're in difficulty or in trouble. That's our God. And there's so many other things says about him in this psalm. Now, that's on one side, God. But on the other side, what, is, what, is, what about man? Well, there are three things that are said about man. I want to talk about that. Three things from verses 15 to 18. First of all, the first thing that is said about man here, human beings, huh? As for man, the word that is used is ish in Hebrew. The isha is almost the same word, the feminine word. Ish, isha. That's not Adam here. It's ish, the man. It means man and woman. As for human beings, let's say, his days are like grass. Ooh, not a good start. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it and it is gone. Its place knows it no more. Well, that's the first thing I'd say about human beings that they need to accept and realize. They're not eternal. Their life depends on the one who is the living God. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Jesus says, says he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. And if they're alive today, which they are, it's because God allowed it. They could just be dead, finished. That's it. But God allowed them to live because he's a living God. That's the first thing we need to know about ourselves. And never forget, it's funny that death is all around us. We've had people that have died in our families, and sometimes people forget. They know that that can happen, you know? Death can kill us. It can. So we have that. And then it says about human beings, the steadfast love of the Lord, but the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. Ah, there is something that is everlasting. It's not my body. It's not the, the physical side. But there's something that's everlasting, and that's what here? The steadfast love of the Lord. It's not just love. It's steadfast love. It's a love that continues whatever. It's an unconditional love. It's a love that will always love you. He will always love you. From everlasting to everlasting to those who fear him. Now here's the thing. If we are people who are going to die and that's it, how then is it possible to say that this person that has disappeared, he's gone, he's dead, that God still loves him? You can only love a person that's alive. That's there to be loved. There is a relationship there. If death is the end of it, love is finished. But love overpowers death. Love, God is love. It overpowers that death that we can expect. That's the everlasting love. It's important to be connected to that love because it's everlasting. And that determines our eternity too, our destiny. But it says that to those who keep his covenant and remember his commandments, but also to those who fear him. Now, if I say that to somebody who doesn't have much faith, so well, what about fear here? That reminds me of the gods of Egypt, the gods of Egypt, the gods of Greece, and all of these gods, they were afraid. 
But we need to study that fear, and we've talked about it before, and understand what kind of fear it is. It's awe, it's reverence, it's respect. It says he is a father. Well, sometimes you need to be a little bit scared of your father. You know, he has discipline. He, he, he tells you what to do and not to do. It tells us that he is holy. He is perfect. That brings to us a feeling of, we call it fear, of awe, of respect. This is the kind of fear that we have. But it's not the fear that we might think of, like a, 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 a negative fear, because, because he says he forgives you. He cares for you. He loves you. So we have to understand what this is all about. And to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his command. So what is it about us then? We don't have all these divine qualities that are described here. He is like that. What about us? What is our place in the universe? What do I need to be careful about? That I'm, I can die? I will die. We're mortal. Secondly, that we need to be in awe and respect of God. And we need to keep His commandments. We need to be in covenant with Him. It's all how we, how we need to respond to who, to who God is. We have to respond to that. We have to overcome any obstacle that's in the way of this relationship between us and God. We do. It's an obstacle. It is our obstacle that we need to overcome. There's always, I think, this question when we read so many of these qualities of God that are described like here. If that is the case, and God is so good, He's so holy, He loves us so much, why is it then we go through things? Let me show you something there in the book of James. It talks about that. James begins in the first chapter of his letter to say that, Don't be deceived, my beloved brothers, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. There's no suffering, no pain, no problem, no death that can be directly attributed to God. God is a God of life, a God of healing, a God of goodness. That's right. But why is it then that later on he says... At the end, having talked about oh, God is the source of all goodness, oh, I want that. I, will, I want that. I want health. I want all good things for me. But it doesn't work like that. Because we don't get that. And we're going to die anyway. So why? What's going on here? What is happening in, in, for the human being? Because God is so good. Well, here's what James says at the end in chapter 5. As an example of suffering and patience. What? Suffering and patience. I don't, I don't get it. I mean, on one side, God is the author of everything that's good and perfect. And now he talks about suffering and pain. You mean those two things coexist? I mean, I, I can't choose between one or the other. No, you've got to bring them together. It's, how, it's funny how people's thinking goes because we have these dichotomies a lot of time in our thinking. Oh, there are those who say, well, God is good. He's the author of everything that's good. So that means if I come to him in faith, everything will be perfect. I will not get sick. I will become rich. Everything I want, I'll get. Not true. We've got pain, suffering, death, trials. And then there's the others who say all of life is about pain and suffering and there's nothing good about life. It's, you know, no, we have, to, we have to live with both. And there's like that with many things. And we have a hard time with that. But what does he say? As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed. We consider them blessed. Ah, blessed. Who remain steadfast. Not blessed those who got everything they wanted from God. No. Here's what happens. If we got everything we wanted from God, the minute you get everything you want from God, oh, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. You know what's going to happen? It's going to take a very short time until you turn your back to God. Because the things you get from God will become the goal of your life, and you will be so satisfied with the, what God gives you that you don't need God anymore. You know what that's called? Being spoiled. That's the reason that 
if we have children, we've got to be careful. If we spoil them, we give them so much. They love what we give them. They love this, they love that, but they forget us. <laughs> they forget us. And when we're in trouble, when we have difficulty, when we're in pain, when we're sick, forget about those old parents. No, it's not like that. We love our parents. Thank you that you give me this. Thank you, parents. Thank you, daddy. Thank you, mommy. But I love you more than what I can get from you. That's real love. That's true love. That's the way we should love God. Not because I can get this from God, and then I'll be fine. This kind of religion, which is not the biblical faith, will get people to turn their back on God, will bring unbelief. That's for sure. Consider those who remain faith steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Now, how is that possible? That in the midst of his sufferings and his pains, that he can still say, and he did say a number of times, Job, you are a merciful and compassionate God, and I love you, and I will trust you all my life. I'm here on the bed, sick. Oh, I just lost all that money. I lost this job. This person said this bad thing about me. But God, you are more important than all of that. And I trust you. I trust that you will figure it out and you will resolve many things I cannot. And we as human beings cannot resolve. Because this is not the end of the story. This life we have on earth is short, like it says. We're mortal. But that's not the only part of our life. That's the small part of our life. It's a small part of who we are. What does it say? 2 Corinthians verse chapter 4. We do not lose heart. Why? Because though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. There are like two parts. My body, my muscles, my physical part. But there's an inner being. That's the one God is working on. That's the one that is going to live forever. That's the one we need to work on. The inner self. This light momentary affliction is preparing for us eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. The Bible is about God, basically. It's about the unseen. If we make of the Bible a manual of psychology, it's not what it is. Oh, there's good counsel there, but that's not the purpose. If we make the Bible a book on human history, that's not the point. We can make the Bible something that it's not. It's not that. The Bible is the living Word of God that helps us discover who He is and grow in our inner self. Like He says here, the things that are unseen and that are eternal. Oh, that takes faith. That really takes faith. We better not be like Thomas said, unless I see, I'm not going to believe. No, we can't be like that. Faith is about the unseen. But how do you know the unseen exists? We trust the Word. There are a lot of things you have not seen. I have not seen. But you will be surprised when you see them. I even think it's true even in our short life on earth. You know, if you persist in faithfulness, if you persist doing what's right, you will see things. You will begin to see, wow, that's what it was all about. I didn't know that's what love is. I didn't know that's what having children is. I didn't know that's what growing up means. I didn't know that that's what prayer does. You grow. You begin to see God acting in your life. But it takes steadfastness. It takes time. There's no fast food with God. It can take months and years. Persist. Be steadfast. And you will see. But not just in this life. We'll see incredible things that God will do. We've seen only a small part of what God intends for us. 
And everything he plans for us is perfect and good. There's no bad. Nothing to be, to be afraid of. You can all relax. That's what Jesus said. Come to me. You're heavy laden. You carry big burdens. Come to me. And I will take your burdens. I will take them. Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. Just listen and do what I say. Oh, it must be hard to do what Jesus says. No, 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 no. What's hard is to carry those anxieties and worries like everybody else sometimes does. That's hard in life. If you can just give up on that and feel good about God in your life, God is good. I don't have to be angry. I don't have to be mean. I don't have to be anxi have anxiety. I can just relax and do what God tells me to do. I don't think we can serve God well if we're full of anxiety and worry. I mean, that takes a lot of energy. Huh? I don't have to be a psychologist or a doctor to know that that takes about 80% of our energy. Why? For what? When you can be relaxed. God is taking care of it. God will do it. I can't deal with this problem. I can't deal with this problem, with this person. Oh, they said this, they said that. You know what? Take it all and put it in a box. And on the box it says, God will take care of it. Put it there. And do what you have to do. Leave that box over there. God will take care of it. Don't worry about it. You do what you have to do. Do your best. Let's do our best. Let's serve God with a lot of calm and a lot of joy, a lot of steadfastness. I think if we do that, people will notice. Say, what happened to him? What happened to her? There's something weird over there. It looked a little too cool for me. Too calm. Too Frenchy. No, not 